The WAFB Podcast Network is sponsored by Neighbors Federal Credit Union. Hey, good morning, Jacques. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. I'm talking to Garth Brooks. <laughs> Dinner in his second year as the LSU head football coach. It was the only way I could get a, a foot in the door. Joined by the icon, Kim Mulkey. Hey, Coach, great to see you. Jacques Talk is sponsored by Cork's Cajun Fried Fish and Shrimp and Kuyan's Cajun Barbecue. It's my pleasure to welcome Billy Lucci from TexAgs.com. He is a media giant who covers the Texas A&M Aggies. And uh, Billy, thanks so much for making some time today. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me. Big week, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, both of these teams are undefeated. Now, granted, neither has played uh, Texas, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee. But the facts are the facts. These are the last two undefeated teams in the SEC and I saw that uh, A&M, they drew, what, 108,000 for the Notre Dame game. So I would imagine it'll be that many this week as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be as many as they, as many as that stadium, Kyle Field, can fit in there. There, there will be this weekend. And I heard, you, I heard what you said a second ago about those teams. I would say this. Uh, I think neither LSU nor A&M would, would be too scared of playing uh, Bama or Tennessee right now. Bama with their issues, Tennessee with the, the way their offense has been playing. And uh, as far as Texas goes, that's an interesting one because I think uh, in, of the teams contending in the SEC, they've played the weakest schedule in hindsight to date. Uh, when you look at LSU with wins over like at South Carolina, uh, a victory in Fayetteville, a win over Ole Miss, and you look at A&M, uh, with the uh, the win neutral over Arkansas at the Swamp, Mississippi State not good, but going and winning there in Starkville and Cowbell Country, it, it's these teams are a little more proven, I think, than than they're uh, than they're getting credit for. They both beat the Arkansas team that beat Tennessee, and for that reason, this is about to be the biggest. I think it's the biggest game a has played at home. Since they joined the SEC, the Johnny Manziel, Nick Saban won in 2013. The rematch had more hype. It was early in the season, but that was each team's first SEC game, or at least A&M. So, I mean, this is these are two teams now that know if you win this game, you have an excellent shot uh, to reach both the playoff and, and even if you want to narrow it down a little more specific, you have a really, really strong shot to reach the SEC title game. And it's not like when you guys went, what, when LSU went a couple of years ago, you knew you, that the Tigers were not going to beat Georgia. There is no Georgia unbeatable looming there. There is no Nick Saban, Alabama uh, looming there. This is a conference title that's there for the taking for those teams you mentioned and these two play on Saturday night, and and certainly the winner will have a great shot at it. Great points. Um, would you say that this is a game coming up for Texas A&M that they have not been able to win in the past? Uh, yes and no. I think if if you're talking about that breakthrough, get you not not that they're they're there if they beat LSU, but you know yeah. we know what what we're talking about when you say that that game that that massive spotlight game that people look at and go, if they win this, they are going to be, it, it, we're going to look at them differently, right? Like we're going to look at them as a true contender late in the season or somewhere along the way, that breakthrough game that kind of cements you as, as a top 10 program. Yes. They've consistently fallen short in that game. As far as there, there's a little bit of a narrative out there that I do think is wrong is that A&M can't win big, high-profile games. They've beaten, you know, let's just go back to since Jimbo arrived. So so halfway through their SEC tenure, they've beaten two top 10 LSU teams. They beat a number one Bama. They beat a number three Florida. Uh, they beat a top 10, uh, they beat a top 10 Missouri team this year. There's another top 10 win I'm, I'm forgetting in that time. I think it's at six right now in the last, counting this year, seven years where they've beat a top 10 team at home. And then you go back, uh, even under Kevin Sumlin, there were a few of those. So they've, they've won those high-profile big games, and they've won them with a decent degree of, of uh, 
consistency at home, especially when you consider usually a and kind of the lower ranked team. But what they haven't done is what, you, what, what I think you're getting at, right? That, that program, when it kind of catapults you into a, a little bit different, you're viewed a little bit differently after that. And I do think, whereas LSU has won those over the years, and even without 2019, They've won those a lot over the years since A&M's been in the SEC. Texas A&M has not done enough of that. Like, yeah, it's one thing to beat Alabama when you're unranked at home. It's a different thing to be in a top 10 showdown. Or I guess A&M's not in the top. They would be if they won, I think. A, a SEC showdown to really thrust yourself into a pole position in this race uh, in late October. The, these opportunities haven't come around very often, and when they have, yeah, a and has not capitalized. Uh, Brian Kelly said that uh, Kyle Field is upper echelon SEC. He said, no offense to Arkansas and USC, uh, South Carolina. Those are hard places to win. But uh, when you've got that many fans, how, how would you describe the atmosphere there? Because when I went there two years ago, A&M was going nowhere fast, not even a bowl game. And the okay. Saturday after Thanksgiving, they packed the place like they're having a great season. And uh, A&M punched the LSU in the mouth that night. Yeah, I look, I have all the respect in the world for for Death Valley. I've been there. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm, I'm going to LSU Bama in a few weeks. Really looking forward to that. Um, so when he says upper echelon, there, the thing that no fan base will agree upon, and I do think, I think Death Valley and Baton Rouge and, and Knoxville, to me, are the two most hostile environments I, I've seen A&M play in. Loudest, yes, host, most hostile. But then A&M, Kyle Field at night is going to be every bit as loud. Uh, there's just a group of them that sit at the top. And Texas A&M and Kyle Field for a big game at night is going to be right up there. Like you said, uh, that was a 4-7 and seven A&M team that was playing LSU that night. Um, a couple weeks ago, that was an 11 a.m. game against a top-10 team, but it was still it was Missouri. No offense to the folks in Columbia, but it wasn't LSU. It wasn't Alabama. It wasn't Georgia coming in here or Texas. It was Missouri, and it was still, uh, to me, it was as loud an 11 a.m. game as I've been at. So, I, yeah, I think this is going to be whatever, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100 in terms of atmosphere, noise, all of that, that's, that's, what, this, that's what this will be. And, you know, look, LSU's used to it. A&M's used to it. You, you go to... To, that's what I've tried to tell Texas and know you fans this whole time. Y'all aren't used to it. You're just not. You might do it once in a year, but when you have to go week after week after week and, and you go, your little off week is going to play in Fayetteville from, from, from the 100,000 and, and Death Valley and Jordan Hare and, and Bryant Denny and the Swamp, you, you know, and Neyland Stadium. And then, oh, we'll get an off week, but we have to go deal with, Cowbells in Starkville, or we have to go. So it's that's the difference, and and so yeah, I think I think LSU and the players and everything will be used to it. But I still think no matter how used to it you are, there's a massive advantage for both of these teams when one of them's playing in front of their fans. You know, whether it's the twelfth man, whether it's the purple and gold, uh, it is a massive advantage for the team at home, and it's no matter how poised and and veteran you are it's a it's a big disadvantage for for the opposing team particularly offense well said i want to ask you about a couple of local guys that have local ties for us so tommy moffitt's the strength and conditioning coach through the heyday of lsu football all three national championships since 2003 and another uh appearance in 2011 and he he doesn't uh he says it's flat out. I was fired uh, when Brian Kelly got here. So um, what, what impact has he made on uh, the, the program? I mean, I, I was actually talking to a couple former LSU players this morning that's, that have, since the day he got hired, you know, as you know, better than me, they swear by him. And uh, you notice it in everything these guys do because it's such a night and day difference. No offense to the guy. Well, the guy before him had never been a head strength coach at this level that Jimbo hired to replace another legend in, in Jerry Schmidt. But you just we just had Nick Scorton uh, in here for an interview, defensive end, Purdue transfer. But 
just to see him from one off season under Moffitt. And I remember him from high school here at Bryan High uh, locally. All the players, when they come in and you look at them physically compared to a year ago, and you hear them talk about Tommy Moffitt, when we're sitting here at this desk just kind of chit-chatting before they go on, and, and, and it comes up organically. It's not me. Hey, what do you think of Moffitt? You know, so they just revere him already here. And I think he's also added it's such a tough mindset, a, a tough guy mindset and culture. Um, the biggest thing I notice in these guys, it's easy to get after it, you know, uh, when you're winning and stuff, but just the fight, the fight. And I think that Moffitt has instilled that in the off season. It's a physical and mental toughness thing that I think has been, that I think has been lacking. So I think Elko was thrilled uh, when he was able to tell me that that was happening uh, back in the off season, I, I could tell just in his tone of voice that he was pretty fired up, even just to hear my reaction, because it wasn't on my radar, right? I mean, you guys down there probably knew that he was itching to get back. If he was, I'm assuming he was. But when I was wondering who they were going to hire for strength coach, it just ne I never even thought about that one. And then all of a sudden to hear that was happening. Definitely different vibes than when AM hired John Chavis from the LSU fan base. <laughs> that time they were like, go take him, please. He, <laughs> this is the exact opposite. So they were right the last time and, and they were right this time too. I'll give I'll give the the people down in Baton Rouge credit. Well, it's gonna be interesting to see him wearing maroon and white, kind of like uh, Nolan Kane with baseball. I mean, here's a yeah. guy that pitched at LSU, won a national championship, was Maneri's right-hand man all those years, and now he's wearing maroon and white. It's it's kind of weird. Now you know? burn orange. What's that? And now oh. burn orange. Oh, that's right. That's right. So yeah, it's weird for y'all. And, and it's weird for LSU and a &M fans at this point. But, uh, but no, I actually sent a picture uh, during the Missouri game. I sent a picture to T-Bob and Hester on the group chat of – it's just Moffitt. I was kind of standing – Caddy corner took a picture of him just kind of standing there with arms crossed, kind of observing the game, and they they just both went nuts. They loved it. But he's like you said, he's in maroon. It's a yeah. different. Yeah, I interviewed him yesterday, and he said he had to promise his players he would not go and mingle or shake hands with any LSU players before the game, only after. That's so, great. That's great. Uh, because I because when two years ago a lot of LSU guys went and kind of hobnob with Max Johnson and I kind of heard some fans saying we don't do that you know we're going to war we shouldn't be mingling so anyway I agree you know what I agree with that like yeah. this is not a uh, LSU fans love to say this isn't a rivalry and I don't think AM fans are have have embraced calling it a rivalry but there's been some wild fun stuff in this football series since it started I mean you know some of it's actually insane. And then you think of even when the games haven't been of the magnitude, there's these storylines every time. It's like Joe Burrow's Heisman coronation and the revenge game. It was, is this Les Miles' last game where he's like basically waving goodbye to the fans before the game and then he stays. It's Jimbo Fisher being at a and it, It's Scott Woodward being back at LSU. There's been so many interesting it's Max Johnson, like you said. Literally, the next game he played after beating a &M, which, by the way, was Ed O's going away party. It, it's been a fun series, it's, and I do think it's been it, – it acts like a rivalry. No one wants to call it that, and that's fine. It's ironic that when Texas is coming into the league and the year that a and is going to renew their real rivalry, this one that I think the SEC – and everybody tried to force, right? They moved Arkansas off of Thanksgiving weekend. They put A&M. Uh, that's LSU replaced Texas. It's funny that the one year that everybody was, okay, they're real rivals back. Now it is arguably the most important game on, on both teams' schedule right now. Yeah. And I, I think also the most – I think it's going to prove to be the most impactful game on both teams' schedule. Yeah. And that's not even to mention that seven-overtime game. My God. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, I think the overtimes took an hour and forty five minutes. If I'm not mistaken. So yeah, there's a hundred storylines just in that game alone. Yeah, no doubt. Um, uh, two more things, Le Le'Veon Moss. Um, you know, anytime a guy pops up for another team scoring touchdowns, and he's from Baton Rouge, LSU fans, why isn't he playing for us? Now it's kind of been a slow burn for him, right? I mean, he wasn't like a one thousand yard rusher right off the bat. He's having his best year in his third year 
right now. I think there were some reasons why he needed to get to get out of Baton Rouge to go play for the Aggies. Tell, tell me about him. I love him, man. He just just real pleasure to deal with um, and was patient. You know, like they flipped him from Bama, and then I know LSU made a run at him late, and he stayed through a coaching change. You know, injuries early in his career, and then he stayed through a coaching change. But Jimbo told me from day one, he said, I think he can be one of the best to come through here. I think he's that good. And Jimbo was completely sold on. And then Elko gets here. Um, and without question, when they were here in the spring, and, and they also had Reuben Owens at that time, who was a five-star a year ago, got hurt during fall camp for the season. But I think the position that these coaches probably got here and went, wow, like this is even more to work with than maybe we thought. It was Le'Veon Moss and and – Owens and Amari Daniels and, and now EJ Smith, but Moss in particular is a guy that just I remember in spring ball, people say, man, the practice he had yesterday or or during fall camp, uh, this goal line drill they did one day where it's like Le'Veon was just unstoppable. He is he is a such a competitor. He's such a physical, tough dude. And then just you've watched him as the season's gone on, his vision and feel for his blocking has gotten better and better and better. And and the results speak for themselves. He, you know, if you look at his numbers from this week, I think it was 17 for 65 or 68 yards, very deceiving. Uh, he had a 30 plus yard run call back because of an illegal formation uh, and then had a 40 yard run called back because of uh, a hold that if you watch it, you go, okay, I think they accidentally meant to call that on the defense defender since he tackled uh, the A&M offensive lineman. So I think I mean, my point is those were legitimate yards earned. He could have had a monster day uh, in Starkville Saturday, and he's capable of that any time out is what he's starting to show. I think he's one of the two best, you know, top three running back in the SEC right now and with a chance to end up, you know, being the leading rusher in this league. Outstanding. Um, you mentioned Jimbo Fisher. We went and interviewed him during the summer. We went to Tallahassee just on all LSU stuff when he was an assistant coach. Yeah. And uh, how much money do you guys have? I mean, how can you write a $75 million check for somebody to do nothing? Like every now and then when LSU loses a game, people get mad and they go to Facebook or Twitter, fire Brian Kelly. And we're like, look, yeah. he, there's, he he's not being fired for uh, years down the line. It's too much money, right? But how much money is over there to make to write these checks? I'm over here smiling like it's my money, like I'm sitting on a, a mint over here. But yeah, <laughs> it, there is a, it's it's not infinite, like people say, and, and there's not hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these donors walking around with these giant cowboy hats and coming straight off for you know the the this big big oil cowboy hats and boots and cigars and, and just throwing millions upon millions of dollars at NIL. It, it's not what it is. It's a smaller group, but there is a ton. There is plenty of money at a and um, But like most places, they're, they're just as worried about what's coming in college athletics as anybody because, again, it is, it is finite, and there's a ton of money. There's a ton of expenses. And in this day and age of NIL – I could be a guy that's sitting here, and if AM beats LSU and they go beat Texas to end the year and they're in the SEC title game in year one under Mike Elko, I'm if I have the money and I'm cut them a ten million dollar NIL check. But if they would have lost to Bowling Green in Arkansas in year one, and I'm sitting here going, Man, I don't know how much I like this, and and good luck getting the dollar out of me. So that's that's the reality of college sports now, even at places like AM, LSU. Tuscaloosa, Austin, Columbus, Ohio. Like, so there's still that pressure to, to, no matter how much you have to keep it going. And as far as firing Jimbo, I did not think, I knew AM had that money essentially put away. Um, and I knew that, you know, the way it was spread out, it was, it was doable. I just didn't think because of that price tag, I didn't think they'd do it. But that's what I keep having to tell AM fans about. The job Mike Elko is doing, whatever you want to think about it, right? Whatever your opinion, my opinion, someone else's opinion, wherever you're at with it, 
just know this. Also factor in that the people around here thought the situation was so untenable. And, and I, by the way, I really like Jimbo Fisher as a person. I think he was close to getting it done here as a coach, he, and it didn't happen, and then it started to go downhill. Uh, that Just the foundation wasn't strong enough. They'd had to get over that hill. They couldn't do it. But if you look at it, like, I, I think, remember – that they thought the situation was so untenable, right, that they wrote essentially a $75 million check to, to bring about change. So whatever the job you think Mike Elko is doing now, also remember what it's coming on the heels of. So if he's able to pull Saturday night off and this team sitting at 7-1 and one and, and ranked in the top 10 eight games in uh, at 5-0 and oh in the league, that's pretty remarkable. Awesome. When did you start your website? I started in this thing in, in 1998. Um, I was graduating with a degree that wasn't journalism, it was industrial distribution. And I lived about, I'd say, 100, not even 100 yards from behind this wall, uh, living with uh, a couple guys. One of them I just had lunch today with Seth McKinney, who played for a while at, you know, in the NFL. Shane Leckler, who I think will be a Hall of Fame punter one day, should be anyway. And then Dan Campbell, the Lions head coach, obviously. But we all lived right over there. And I was typing up articles for a print publication at the time, uh, the Maroon and White Report, and having them yell at me, let's go, finish this up. I'll give you a quote. Let's get it. We got it, you know, to go hit the bars. So that that's how long ago this thing started. It's the only job I've ever had. That's outstanding. And um, at the time, 1998, you know, what's the internet? And the uh, the logging on and the funny noises and all that yeah. uh, to, to see where it is today and what you've built. I know you have to be uh, proud of it. Yeah, no doubt. This is, this is our new studio stuff, and it's it's been fun. It's been fun watching it grow. It's been fun, you know, watching people come and go. Sometimes they come in and they they go off into you know orbit, you know, in the sports world. It's been it's been fun to just watch the whole thing. It went from literally work working in a a shared bedroom, four of us in a two bedroom apartment to now we've got, you know, 40 plus people here working. And it's just a little fun, little machine that we keep trying to grow, but it, it definitely, as you know, it makes it more fun, more rewarding, more enjoyable when, when the team you're covering is winning. And when the teams you're covering are winning, like things like you've covered probably, I, I can't imagine I don't know the, the length of time, right? How many college world series have you covered? You know, that's, that was new here these last three seasons and what happened last year. It's just, it's a lot of fun. I don't care to look at the price tag sometimes um, because I'm not one of those big oil money, but when we go cover Omaha for two weeks, it gets, it gets a little pricey. It's a little different than taking a quick ride to Baton Rouge, but uh, no, it's just when, when things, when you're playing in games like this one, uh, and this is the third top 10 opponent to come to Kyle Field in, in well, four games at Kyle, but in eight games this year, A&M's played. Three of them, this is the third one uh, that'll be against a top 10 team. So they're definitely, uh, and, and they've all been at home, and there's another one that's going to come in. So they're going to play, I don't see how, I don't see Texas falling out of the top 10. So they're going to play four top 10 teams at home this year. So right now it's 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 one and one and counting. Yeah, well, when those two teams finally get together, I mean, what, what is that going to be like? Because I know I've heard in the past they've tried to pair them up in bowls and they've said, no, it's going to be too nasty. We're not going to do this. I mean, uh, now that there's no choice there. They've got, they've got to play. Yeah. And you know what? I don't think they were really doing that because it was too nasty. I think Mac Brown wanted no part of, of Johnny Manziel and, and that, that group one year. And then another year it was, a and M would have would have throttled Texas. Some one of those strong or Herman was being fired or was on the ropes, and they were like, "We don't want to play." I think A and M was on that side of it at least one point uh, with Sumlin, where Texas was up, and it looked like they might meet. So I think there's been a lot of artful dodging on on both a little bit on each side during this stretch. I was always of the opinion I never wanted A and M to play Texas when the Aggies were in the SEC because they canceled the series. DeLos Dodds 
got on his soapbox and said they wouldn't play him. They went and what people and and you you know this, y'all have dealt with it enough. Texas will manipulate the hell out of any situation in any conference they're in. And the SEC and Georgia and everybody else saw a little bit of that this past weekend. What happened in Baton Rouge I mean, when, when LSU went to Austin a few years ago with Burrow? Was that the no AC in the visiting locker room? Was that that or was there no water? It was something. Um, 1998, it hadn't rained in Austin in a month. The field was soaking wet. My roommates played in that game. The field was soaking wet. Ricky Williams ran wild. A&M didn't have the right cleats. It, it's going to happen every time. So my thing was, when, when the Aggies were in the SEC and they canceled, why on earth, if you were A&M, would you willingly play them when they are desperate for meaningful home games because they play OU in Dallas every year? Why would you throw them a life vest when you're in the SEC playing LSU, Bama, Tennessee, Florida, Auburn, you know, they're sitting there with Baylor, Iowa State, Kansas. So my my deal was don't ever play them. I, if they were going to meet in a bowl, to me it needed to be something like the Cotton or the Sugar Bowl, something that big of, of giant magnitude. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as they signed on and joined that league, immediately I said, okay, now we can't get there fast enough because I do want the rivalry. I do want to see maroon and white and burnt orange at Kyle Field, at DKR, it means a ton in this state. I don't think there's a lot of uh, fan hostility in stadium. That's mainly reserved for Twitter. I do think, though, it's going to be intense because there's just families are going to be uh, very much divided Thanksgiving week. Well, just to wrap up, uh, when LSU played over there, I remember reading the newspaper article. They had quotes from the president, the AD, maybe, I forgot. And they said something like, we could have hired Ed Ogeron for a sack of crawfish. We got our man and Tom Herman and just said some things out loud that maybe were true, but just very arrogant to say, you know, out loud. And they lost the game and Tom Herman got flushed. And so did Ed Ogeron eventually, but yeah. Ogeron did better than Herman. <laughs> so, yeah, he got, he got a ring out of it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So, well, Billy, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for your time. Congratulations on all your success there. We look forward to seeing you at uh, Kyle Field. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. It's going to be fun.